Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. We'll begin with the beginning of the third chapter of the book of Genesis and a prayer. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your intention to deify us. We ask you now to pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may see the truthfulness of your intention and the falsity of those who speak against you. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, Praise. in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This talk is titled, False Deifications, Rejecting the Demonic, the Heretical, and the Ludicrous. I want us to think about how, in Genesis chapter 3, the temptation is a temptation about deification. Again. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad, and you will be like gods. Have you ever heard uh, objections to deification? And do those objections object to deification because it's, frankly, demonic? You know, that, that this is something of the devil, or something that is heretical. This is not the truthfulness of the Christian faith in its fullness, or frankly, that's ludicrous. Well, there are forms of deification that are demonic, heretical, and ludicrous, okay? I want us to realize that. Just because something is called deification doesn't mean that it's good, Okay? It could be something that's bad. Think about all the different kinds of of permutations of Trinitarian faith. Okay? Uh, Because you have the the Catholic Orthodox faith in God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but you have other forms of thinking about the Trinity. You have Arianism, which is a form of subordinationism. Uh, You have modalism. Uh, in terms of these three, uh, one becomes the other depending upon the stage in history, okay? Each of them would speak of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just that Arianism and modalism are heresies. They're wrong, okay? Now, what I want us to do then is in this talk, especially to think about that which is wrong. Daniel Keating says, Uh, deification is often praised or dismissed without a clear understanding of what it entails. Okay? And uh, and so this is where, in terms of thinking about what this means through the wrong way, okay? The wrong ways. If you are traveling, it can be helpful to have certain signs that say things like dead end, okay? So that means don't go there unless you really want to go into a dead end. Uh, uh, you know, wrong, or sometimes, frankly, wrong way, okay? You may see a sign that just says wrong way. Okay? You'd be going in the opposite lane, okay? It, this would be really bad. 
St. Thomas Aquinas knows that in the life of wisdom, there is both a promulgation, a meditation and promulgation of that which is true, and then a refutation of that which is false. When he begins his Summa Contra Gentiles, he quotes the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 7. My mouth shall meditate truth, and my lips shall hate impiety. Proverbs 8, verse 7. My mouth shall meditate truth, and my lips shall hate impiety. Wow. Okay. Do you really need to hate? Actually, a part of the Christian life is precisely to love that which God loves and to hate that which God hates. You know, to be able to detest sin, error, falsehood, okay? To be able to detest injustice, unrighteousness. And then that can help us precisely in understanding righteousness. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas says that this is like, the, uh, like medicine, okay? So you, why would you have medicine? Well, one way to take medicine is if you want to effect health and to get rid of illness. Um, if you went to a doctor's office and thought that the doctor was not going to speak to you about illnesses, well, would you really want to go back to that doctor? I mean, this is why we go to doctors, is because we have illnesses. There are illnesses of the mind. And you need to go to teachers of wisdom who will not only tell you, okay, this is, this is the way, walk in it, but bad way, bad way, bad way, okay? They'll lead you nowhere, okay? Or actually, they will lead you somewhere. It's called hell, okay? This really is actually the tradition of the, of, of the Christian religion, is to be able in wisdom to uh, meditate on truth, and hate and piety. Uh, let's think about St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul, in the first chapter of Galatians, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly forsaking the one who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, not that there is another, but there are some who are disturbing you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one that you've received, let that one be accursed. With that language, let that one be accursed. If you go back to the Greek and then the Latin translation, you would find anathema. Okay, so the church has a very long tradition of giving anathemas. St. Paul does it, such as, for example, Galatians chapter 1. So an anathema, let that one be a curse, is to be able to have that clarity. Don't do that. Okay? So in terms of, think again about a doctor's office. A doctor needs at times to, to tell you, don't eat those things. Don't drink those things. Don't do blank this or that. Or if you continue to do X, Y, Z, this is what's going to happen to your body. Uh, the doctor really is... is is trying to look out for your best interest of health. So teachers of wisdom are looking out for the best interest of your spiritual health. And deification is not a minor point. It is something about the intention of God and creation. You can think about Catechism of the Catholic Church number one that Dr. Spazano told us about last night. Okay, that, the, that God's very intention is to share his blessed life with us. All right, so what I want us to do now is to go through different ways where deification goes wrong, okay? And uh, the very first, and then we'll have time for questions and answers uh, after this. The very first way where deification goes wrong is to have a wrong God, to not have the one true living God. And so in my examples for this, I'm choosing two. An ancient example of paganism, and then a modern example of Mormonism. Okay? So this is where, in terms of just thinking about how deification, what does that mean literally in terms of the fication is to be made? To be made God or gods, or to be made sharers of God, or however you want to form that. But that 
um, that it's really dependent upon God. If you have a different God, you'll have a different form of deification. Right? It sounds simple, but sometimes people don't get this. So the first example is an ancient example, and I've chosen Clement of Alexandria. So Clement of Alexandria was a late second, uh, beginning the third century, uh, great uh, wisdom figure he, uh, in terms of he was a great teacher in, in the school there in Alexandria. And the first of his catechetical works, so to speak, is called the Protrepticus. Okay, so I want us to get a little bit of the context of this. Protrepticus is a word, protrepticos in Greek and then in Latin protrepticus, is a word that means an exhortation to persuade people to do something as particularly a new way of life. Philosophies will have different kinds of protrepticoi, right? So that you have an exhortation to get people to rethink, to change their mind, to have a different way of life. And so Clement of Alexandria then has his exhortation to the nations. He is a Christian. And what does he want to do in the late second century? He wants to invite people to Jesus. Sometimes people will talk about the second century as the age of the apologists. And what does ap ap apologia mean, apology mean? Well, that's a defense, okay? So in terms of uh, when you have an apology, you're defending what you're holding on to, to something who's attacking you, okay? With Protrepticus, you're saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I think that the second century is actually more of the age of the Protreptics than of the apologies. Uh, so uh, if you wanted to ask about that, I have, I have thoughts, all right? <laughs> but, the, but the Christian religion is, a, is, is evangelizing. Not every way of life is like this. But there's something about our way of life where, in fact, the perfection of, of being a Christian is to invite others, to get people into God. Okay? So in terms of that deification, that then we become on fire in order to allow God's charity to be at work on us, at us to ignite people and to bring them back to God. Now, there were already different kinds of deification when Clement was living. And uh, have you ever heard that, oh, deification, that's a Greek pagan idea? Well, yes, it was. It, it, deification is, in one form, a Greek pagan idea. You can go through the myths. Um, different kinds of, of heroes and gods uh, sometimes these uh, things are a matter of origin stories of how something came to be. Sometimes they're a matter of politics in terms of, of local politics or in terms of someone with authority. Sometimes it's a matter of literature and enculturation in, in, in terms of a new people. You have all different ways of explaining Greek pagan forms of deification, but there are there. Now, Clement of Alexandria knows that he then is competing against these Greek pagan forms of deification, and he goes back to get people to think, well, um, with this system, who are these gods? And what he finds is that these gods are immoral. Okay, so what he's doing is he's exposing to his people the immorality of their gods and how they then are wanting to imitate them. And he provides example after example after example. So this is where, in terms of, in order to set it up as, as two different kinds of loves, you know, sometimes today people say love is love, okay? Well, actually, uh, every tautology has a truth in itself. Love is love. And then you think about how reference for a particular word can be vastly different, okay? So I love Italian sausage pizza is not the same as I love you. Okay, I don't speak to Italian sausage pizza. I speak to person. All right, and if you say, "Oh, do you love it?" You say, "Oh, yeah, that's really different." Yeah, exactly. And that some loves are immoral and again are, are actually expressions of selfishness, whereas other loves are matters of friendship where you actually will the good 
in God who has made them and who, has known, who, who knows what is good for each of us. Okay, so this is where in terms of Clement of Alexandria is setting up different kinds of loves. So in terms of paganism, he's going to lusts, okay? Because he knows that there are all sorts of lusts at work in people. He says um, uh, that, uh, that uh, let's take the chief of all the Greek gods, Zeus. Um, the mysteries of Demeter commemorate Zeus's sexual relations with her, Zeus's own mother. And Clement continues in the Protracticus with first-person reactions from his listeners about their involvements in the Demeter cult, such as, I went down to the bridal chamber. Clement continues with Zeus's further debauchery, and thus by implication, the immorality of the worshippers. Zeus has intercourse with the fruit of his relationship with Demeter, Persephone. He ravishes his daughter under the form of a serpent, which for Clement reveals what he really was. In imitations, worshippers have a serpent drawn over their breast. Later, Clement continues with the licentiousness of Zeus, such as in his abduction of Ganymede. In all of these pagan mysteries, things and people are falsely divinized for taking in the unreality of the gods. Okay? So this is where, in terms of Zeus, he's the chief god. Do you want to be like Zeus? Do you? That's what Clement is telling his people, because he finds that some people actually do. Okay? So, he uses different kinds of Greek terms to talk about deification. And he emphasizes the personal commitment that leads the adherents of the pagan mysteries to imitate the immoral and especially lascivious pantheon. For example, Clement repeatedly links the mysteries of pagan cults with orgies and traces the etymologies of the two words together. The worshippers then imitate the gods they celebrate through lust. So, uh, or likewise, Clement speaks of the cult that grew from Emperor Hadrian's favorite love, the boy Antinous, who drowned in the Nile. The pederast imitated Zeus's consecration of Ganymede and made Antinous a god. Several decades after this, the people of Alexandria continued to imitate Antinous in their sacred nights of shameful lust. Okay, so this is where, in terms of, of he, he's saying, look, do, do you see what's happening? So Clement is from Alexandria. The emperor uh, fell in love with a boy. The whole empire knew of it. Uh, the boy drowned tragically in the Nile. And so th what, what do they do? Well, the emperor made the boy into a god. Okay? Uh, he had different kinds of festivities and wanted people to practice different kinds of lust. It's a form of deification. Clement censures pagan artwork not only because it depicts the lustfulness of the gods, but because through this depiction it encourages sexual immorality. Some have fallen into lust for statues. And Clement relates stories told about men having intercourse with statues of Aphrodite. Yuck. I mean, this is gross. All right, so um, this is what he's saying. Even people's homes have the image of a naked Aphrodite near their beds, with the residents imitating her adultery in their own unlawful embraces. For another example, he writes of rings being engraved with Leda and Zeus in the form of a pleasure-seeking bird. Clement summarily states, these are the models of your hedonism. These are the divine stories of hubris. These are the lessons of the gods, fellow fornicators for you. In a maxim from Demosthenes, Clement reveals the importance of desire in one's mind. For what one desires that one also imagines. Clement even selects a story from Genesis that parallels the transformation of the Greek myths. Lot's wife has turned to stone because she longed for Sodom, whose inhabitants were godless and turned to impiety with hardened hearts. His point is that idols of stone are only stone. Worshippers become what they desire and love. Okay, worshippers become what they desire and love. For Lot's wife, she turned to stone because she longed for Sodom and their stony hearts. All right, so do you see how uh, that, uh, that this is just awful? And what Clement wants us to do is to know how awful the, um, the practices are out there. In the 19th century, when Clement of Alexandria's Greek texts were translated into English by the anti-Nicene fathers, translators. Some things were translated from Greek into Latin because you needed to have the knowledge of Latin for certain things that, well, Clement talks about because 
we don't want this to be too accessible to people. Okay, so in terms of of uh, certain things about sex, so Clement is very frank, and you think, oh, think about our culture today. Do you have different kinds of deification at work? That is a matter of paganism, and that's a matter of people actually having sexual immorality, because you think it's not that they're godless. Oh, they have a sort of god. And they're imitating that. Another example in terms of false gods, and a modern example, is Mormonism. Now, uh, uh, there are lots of, uh, of Mormons in the United States and in different places in the world. And, uh, and so uh, I, that they can do lots of good. Uh, it must be said that the Catholic Church has decreed that their baptism is not a Christian baptism, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not a Christian community. Why? Well, fundamentally, they have a different God. Okay? They will speak about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They will baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Rome was asked, and in 2001, Rome declared that their baptism was not a valid baptism because they don't mean what Christians mean by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father Luis Ladaria, who's now Cardinal Ladaria, Prefect of the Castry for the Doctrine of the Faith, was asked by the, uh, by the Dicastery to make an official theological statement about it. Ladaria writes, There is not a true invocation of the Trinity, in terms of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints baptism, because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, according to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, are not the three persons in which subsists the one Godhead, but three gods who form one divinity. One is different from the other, even though they exist in perfect harmony. The very word divinity has only a functional, not a substantial content, because the divinity originates when the three gods decided to unite and form the divinity to bring about human salvation. This divinity and man share the same nature, and they are substantially equal. God the Father is an exalted man, native of another planet, who has acquired his divine status through a death similar to that of human beings, the necessary way to divinization. God the Father has relatives, and this is explained by the doctrine of infinite regression of the gods who initially were mortal. God the Father has a wife, the Heavenly Mother, with whom he shares the responsibility of creation. They procreate sons in the spiritual world. Their firstborn is Jesus Christ, equal to all men, who has acquired his divinity in a pre-mortal existence. Even the Holy Spirit is the Son of heavenly parents. The Son and the Holy Spirit were procreated after the beginning of the creation of the world known to us. Four gods are directly <coughs> responsible for the universe, three of whom have established a covenant and thus formed the divinity. So, in terms of Mormons and deification, just one thing that should be stated right off is that there cannot be, there cannot be a legitimacy to Mormon deification within a Christian understanding because they don't have the God of Christian revelation. That, that's what the Church of Rome has said. And, and then this is Father Ladaria, now Cardinal Ladaria, is giving quotations and citations from Mormon literature. All right? So this is really serious. And just to be able to see, oh, okay, so no matter how much you might want to say Mormon deification or Orthodox deification, or how, no, the, 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 deification always means being made like God. Who's the God? It's a different God. All right, it's that serious. So you can do this in other ways too. Just think deification depends on God. Who's your God? If this is not the God of Christian revelation, it's a very different kinds of deification. Another way of thinking about this <coughs> is a confusion about becoming just like one of the Trinity. Okay, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, for this example, I want to go to St. Gregory of Nazianzus. St. Gregory of Nazianzus was a 4th century Greek father who's known as the theologian in the Eastern tradition. That he, uh, he cited more than any other ecclesiastical authority after the Bible in Byzantine literature. Okay, so this is where St. Gregory of Nazianzus, he's the one who coined, did you ever hear the term theosis? 
or in Greek, theosis. He is the one who coined the term, okay, when he's writing against the emperor Julian, uh, so the apostate, who uh, had his own form of pagan deification. He had been a lector in the, in the church, and then once he became emperor, he said, ha-ha, I'm pagan. Uh, let's have pagan sacrifice, all these things. And uh, let's not have, uh, he, he, he refused to call Christians Christians. He said they are the Galileans uh, because he knew the dignity of the word Christian. So he refused to say Christian and he did not want Christians to teach. Okay, so, uh, so Gregory of Nazianzus, as some of his very first work, uh, he has orations four and five against Julian. And, and, uh, and there you'll be able to see how he uses the term Theosis, or theosis. Now, uh, St. Gregory of Nazianzus says, let us speak of a creature as being of God, for that is a great thing when said of us after all, but never as being God. Only then will I accept that a creature is God, when I too may literally become God. This is the point. If something is God, it is not a creature, for the creature is classed with us who are not gods. But if it is a creature, it is not God, for it began in time. And of what had a beginning, there was when it was not. And of what had a beginning, there was when it was not. Right now, Gregory Nazianzus writes this in Oration 42. And uh, one thing that's very important in the fourth century would be theological arguments to affirm that the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, are God. Okay, so you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each is God, and there's only one God. And so against the uh, particularly different kinds of Arianism, different kinds of subordinationists in the fourth century, and the Pneumatomachians, those who are fighting against the Holy Spirit, uh, those who are lessening the Holy Spirit. What St. Gregory of Nazianzus is doing is saying, okay, the Son is God and he deifies us. The Holy Spirit is God and he deifies us. The Son and the Holy Spirit are not deified. They, you know, so it's one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so there is this big difference between that who is, the one who is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and everything else. Okay? So the difference between a crea the creator and creation, each creature. And so this is where, in terms of, of, because sometimes people get confused about this. And they think, oh, well, you become one of the Trinity. No, 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 no. no Gregory of Nazianzus, who coined the term theosis, he is very clear that there, there's only one God, okay? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then how we are made of God, okay? But sometimes he will use the language of gods, okay? Well, because that's what scripture does. Uh, I say you are gods in the psalm, and that's quoted uh, by our Lord in John chapter 10. I say you are gods. So, but he, he doesn't get this confused, and that's very important. Now, St. Cyril of Alexandria is a, a Greek father of the church who is in Alexandria. He dies in the year 444. He's most famous for the Nestorian controversy, so he fought against Nestorius. <coughs> uh, Nestorius had a sort of separation between the divinity and humanity in Christ and did not want to uh, apply things like suffering and death to the person of the Son of God, okay? So that Nestorianism had separated the humanity divinity. So, so Nestorius did not want to say that God was born of Mary. And Nestorius like, oh, come on, don't, don't do that. And Cyril of Alexandria would say, God was born of Mary. She is Theotokos. In fact, Cyril in one place in year 433, two years after the Council of Ephesus in 431, um, uh, said, you, you must realize, when he's writing to John of Antioch, that the whole controversy was about Theotokos. To be able to affirm that the one who was born of Mary is God. The one who suffered and died upon the cross in the flesh is God. Okay? So this is where, in terms of thinking about that one, Jesus Christ, he is God. God in flesh. And, uh, and so what Cyril does is he wants us to know that then we can be uh, made sharers of God. Before Seal of Alexandria, not too many times do you have quotations of 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 4. So in terms of being made partakers of the divine nature, 
But with Cyril of Alexandria, you have many, many times this quotation given. Right? So, so he is one who, who made it particularly popular. And he's very influential in, in all sorts of ways through the history of deification. The best book on St. Cyril of Alexandria is by Daniel Keating. So Daniel Keating is a very fine theologian at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. I mentioned him earlier, uh, and he has a book from Oxford University Press uh, ab about St. Cyril's particular way of thinking about sharing in the divine life, that appropriation of the divine life. Now, what I want us to do is to see how St. Cyril, who is so much known for deification, actually doesn't use really theosis that much as a technical term. He likes, again, 2 Peter 1, being made sharers of, of the divine nature and all sorts of other ways. And each, almost at every move, at, at every move, he puts down the, the impiety, the error, the falsehood. Okay? So he was one who didn't shy away from controversy. There are some people who, oh, I don't want to get into a fight. Zero of Alexandria. Okay. When there are matters of truth at stake in terms of people's salvation, he's there. Uh, he'll put the opponent down. And he does this repeatedly in terms of uh, what we call deification. So um, think about John chapter 6, verse 27. God the Father has set his seal. In one of his arguments, Cyril stresses that divine property is immutability. Immutability which exists in God by nature, and so it does not exist in us at all. He then continues, a kind of stability, however, makes us like that immutability through attention and watchfulness, which do not allow us readily to go after that which we should not want. Um, uh, so, um, so in terms of immutable, come on, are you immutable? And uh, does it mean, do you, do you not change? It's like, oh, well, actually, we're creatures in time. We, we change all the time, all right? So you're going to be, are you going to be gods? Well, God is immutable. So, but Cyril of Alexandria then wants us to make sure that we don't claim that we have a divine immutability because only God by nature is immutable. But then he says, actually, in terms of our attention and watchfulness, so our sobriety, our clear thinking, um, that we don't um, quickly go into bad things, that we actually have this stability of thinking, that is God-like. Okay, so, so we don't have uh, divine immutability, but through a virtuous ascetical practice, we can imitate that in some ways. Cyril here advocates the ascetical practices of the mind so as to have an evenness, enabling us to act in a way similar to divine immutability, but he observes that it would be utter confusion if God were to give up immutability and other properties, and if we could rise up to attain those properties by nature. As it is, human beings remain human, and angels remain angelic. If God were to place his own attributes in us, there would be many gods by nature, capable of creating the earth, heaven, and all other creation. Right? So if God were to place his own attributes in us, there would be many gods by nature capable of creating the earth, heaven, and all other creation. Can you create earth? No. Okay. Do, so do you see how uh, Cyril of Alexandria recognizes that would be ludicrous? That would be stupid. That would be... Uh, and so, so he wants us to think about this. Uh, Cyril concludes that immutability is in the Son essentially, and he is God by nature. Nothing that is not from the Father by nature may reach equal divine dignity. And then by this argument against Arian subordination, uh, Cyril underscores the radical difference between the Son with his divine attributes by nature and creatures. Right now, another way of thinking about this is through the, uh, the anthropomorphite controversy. There were certain monks, okay, they dedicated their life to God. They were living in the desert of Egypt. They had a problem. They thought that when they read about God's right arm in the Old Testament, that God had a right arm, right? And so then can you imagine how this could play out in terms of deification controversies? Well, because now God looks like you, okay? So you, you know, in terms of just thinking about this. So in his letter to Colossier, Colossierius, 
Cyril of Alexandria refutes those who tell monks that since the human being is made to God's image, we ought to believe that divinity has a human shape or human form. Cyril writes that this is utterly witless and capable of making those who choose to think it incur the charge of most extreme blasphemy. Cyril continues, man is unquestionably in God's image, but the likeness is not a bodily one, for God is incorporeal. If we consider the consequences of anthropomorphism on deification, we see that humans becoming godlike would be quite different. Daniel Keating surmises that Cyril may have become cautious of using the language of divinization in order not to give credence to those who are propagating a corporeal resemblance between God and human beings. All right? Because you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, and call to mind that divine intention in creating us. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Notice how, uh, obviously, this is uh, uh, much, this is prior to the serpent's temptation. No, God knows that you will be like gods. Uh, Eve, how were you made? Oh, I was made to the image of God. Yes. Okay, so the serpent was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And he distorted, uh, he gave a lie. Uh, and uh, he didn't want Adam and Eve to think about how they were made and, their, and what God wanted them to be made for. Okay, well, in, during Cyril's lifetime, there were certain people who heard about being, man being made to the image of God and then thought God was bodily, and then, and then they would get all these things confused. Okay. Now, at the beginning of the Nestorian controversy in 429, Cyril writes his Epistle 1 to the letters to the monks of Egypt. Written to spur the monks on to holiness in the faith through their ascetical practice, Cyril's letter treats matters of deification several times in order to differentiate Christ from Christians. The Virgin Mary can be called Theotokos, Mother of God, for she did not give birth to a mere man like us, but rather to the Word of God, the Father made flesh and made man. Cyril continues, even we are called gods by grace. Okay, so called gods by grace. But the Son is not God in this way, but rather in nature and in truth, even if he did become flesh. Cyril considers his opposition to hold that the Word dwelt in a man. In reply, he cites John 14, 23, where Christ promises that he and his Father will come to those who love him and keep his words and will make their abode in them. Indwelling of the divine is what a disciple experiences. Cyril differentiates how Christ has the Holy Spirit and how Christians, also anointed, do, even if we are called gods. Nonetheless, we are not unaware of the limitations of our own nature. We are of the earth and stand in the ranks of servants, but he is not within the limits they, that apply to us, but is son in nature and in truth, and is the Lord of all and from heaven. St. Cyril also says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one true Son, is at once God and man. He is not made God in the way that others are by grace. Rather, he is true God, revealed for our sake in human form. So Cyril's way of speaking about Christ as God and truth or by nature and ourselves as gods by grace provides the linchpin for distinguishing the eternal word's incarnation from our deification. All right, so in terms of incarnation and deification, that God, God's incarnation is for our deification. But don't confuse, um, uh, don't confuse the Son for being deified. The Nestorians were using different kinds of terms in the deification uh, <coughs> speech, and that it became a sort of deification controversy. And uh, Adolf von Harnack, who was this uh, liberal Protestant historian of the late 19th or very early 20th centuries, uh, he ridiculed deification. And he said that here in the Nestorian controversy, Cyril, the Council of Ephesus, they, they made the Virgin Mary into a goddess. Okay? So he's the, uh, he continues this polemic. In fact, he really gives impetus to a polemic against deification, this Adolf von Harnack, uh, by giving an account in his great History of Dogma. Okay? So Adolf von Harnack wrote a multi-volume History of Dogma because he thought 
that the dogma that developed after the New Testament was disastrous. So he wanted to trace, yeah, so he, he was a very intelligent man who wanted to trace this and to be able to, um, to be, have a purity of a form of Lutheranism going back to the gospel uh, uh, without any Hellenization. Okay, that was his project. Now, there are still other ways of deification gone wrong. Uh, some ways are matters of annihilation or absorption into God, losing one's individual existence. That's not Christian. If, uh, if you can encounter someone who has uh, a theory of annihilation, of uh, becoming absolutely nothing and being sucked into God, okay, so that you no longer have any individual existence, that's not Christian. Okay, so, uh, so sometimes it, you may have uh, a saint, a mystic, um, talk about a uh, source of being nothing, but there's a qualification there, all right, because, because that one is still existing. And so to be able to be careful about that, because if you took it too far, then you, you actually would lose your existence, and God does not annihilate. Now, the... Um, in terms of one matter of false deification that I want to emphasize is in terms of morality or practices and the difference between pride and humility. So in the book of Ezekiel chapter 28, we read, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because you are haughty of heart and you say, a God am I. I occupy a godly throne in the heart of the sea, and yet you are a man and not a God. However, you may think yourself like a God. Will you then say, I am a God, when you face your murderers? No, you are a man, not a God. Hand it over to those who will slay you. Um, that here we see in terms of pride. And in the Christian religion, we are deified in Jesus Christ, the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. The way to becoming divine, to go up, to be with God, to reign with God, is to go down with Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> the only way up is down. The only way up is down. To be able to accept God's grace in Jesus and to be conformed to him, to be a living member of his body in humility. I love St. Thomas's commentary on the angelic salutation, the Hail Mary. And so what he does, he goes back to Genesis 3 that we heard at the beginning of this talk, and he compares this to the fruit of Mary's womb. Uh, so you think about the fruit of the womb, okay, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the fruit of Mary's womb. St. Thomas says, the sinner often seeks for something which he does not find, but to the just man it is given to find what he seeks. The substance of the sinner is kept for the just, Proverbs 13. Thus Eve sought the fruit of the tree of good and evil, but she did not find it in that which she sought. Everything Eve desired, however, was given to the Blessed Virgin. Eve sought that which the devil falsely promised her, namely that she and Adam would be as gods, knowing good and evil. You shall be, says this liar, as gods. But he lied because he's a liar and the father of lies. Eve was not made like God after having eaten of the fruit. Rather, she was unlike God in that by her sin, she withdrew from God and was driven out of paradise. The Blessed Virgin, however, and all Christians found in the fruit of her womb him whereby we are all united to God and are made like to him. When he shall appear, we shall be like to him because we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3. Eve looked for pleasure in the fruit of the tree because it was good to eat, but she did not find this pleasure in it. And on the contrary, she, she at once discovered she was naked and stricken with sorrow. And the fruit of the Blessed Virgin, we find sweetness and salvation. He who eats my flesh has eternal life. The fruit which Eve desired was beautiful to look upon, but that fruit of the Blessed Virgin is far more beautiful, for the angels desire to look upon him. You are beautiful above the sons of men. Psalm 44. He is the splendor of the glory of the Father. Eve therefore looked in vain for that which she sought in the fruit of the tree, just as the sinner is disappointed in his sins. We must seek in the fruit of the womb of the Virgin Mary whatsoever we desire. All right, so this is where, in terms of just thinking about uh, this, the original sin and how Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, saves us from sin. And that he wants to give us that grace of deification, 
He came to be, for us to be like him. And a part of that is to reject the devil's lies, to be able to say no. And you can think today about the different kinds of false deifications at work that are, that are uh, around us. Today, there are different kinds of scientific and pseudoscientific attempts for immortality. Um, you can think about, you'll hear different stories, and a lot of money is being invested in this, in terms of artificial intelligence enhancements, transhumanism, posthumanism. Different people want to have sort of godlike experiences through mind altering drugs, um, through a diversity of sexual sins. Sometimes there are various attempted sinful political, social, and personal control of others. I can be a god if I can control you. Okay? Um, and that's political, social, personal. Think of someone who wants to be treated as a god. Or someone who sinfully and pathetically treats another creature as God. This can be really sad. Sometimes in terms of um, uh, wanting someone special to love you. Okay, let's say in, uh, when I, uh, in terms of preparing a couple for marriage, uh, a man and woman here, um, I have to say, if you think that one will make you completely happy, you've just made the mistake of treating that one to be God. Your spouse cannot make you completely happy. Only God can. And you think, huh? Yeah. And people, different kinds of people have delusions. They have false hopes with this life on earth. And, and they think that, that, that they'll have, because only God satisfies. Only God can make us completely happy. And so then to be able to have the clarity of saying no, no, no to the demonic, the heretical, and the ludicrous. And to be able to then to say yes, by God's grace, to his intention of, being, of making us sharers in the divine nature. So we have a little bit of time for questions and answers, discussion. Yes. So uh, Cyril of Alexandria in one of his refutations to the Nestorians, um, developed this idea of the communicatio imata, where Christ's humanity takes on divinity and divinity takes on the sufferability of humanity. Is that, is that a kind of divinization of Christ's humanity? Great, thank you. So the question is, in terms of St. Cyril of Alexandria's writing against the Nestorians, he develops what we call a communication of idioms. The word idiom means something proper, and that things properly said of humans can be said of Christ who is God, and things properly said of God can be said of Christ who is man. So, again, going back to the example of uh, being born of the Virgin Mary. Humans are born. Uh, hum uh, uh, well, then to be able to see, actually, God is the one who is the subject here. All right. Now, this is where, <coughs> in terms of of thinking about Christ's humanity, that Christ's humanity from the first moment of that, and Cyril of Alexandria was the one who coined the term union according to the hypostasis, hypostatic union. Okay, so what we call hypostatic union, hypostasis is a fancy Greek term that means subject, okay, and you can have a rational hypostasis, so what we call a person. Um, but um, Cyril then would recognize that that one is God in flesh. He did not want people to think of Jesus as simply the most exalted of the saints. And because this is God in flesh, you can worship God. In fact, you're called to worship God's own flesh. Okay? So because of this union according to the hypothesis. Now, um, now actually then, one of, the, uh, one of the discussions is precisely how do you treat that humanity, because Christ's humanity has the fullness of God, Colossians uh, chapter 1, the fullness of, of deity dwells within him. Okay? So, so Seal of Alexandria would, uh, would very much affirm that this is not some mere man, but this is God in flesh, and that flesh, that flesh is life-giving flesh. In fact, in terms of the Eucharist, when St. Cyril comments on John chapter 6, um, the spirit gives life, the flesh is no avail, he says, all flesh is no avail except the flesh of Christ, because this is the flesh of the word, and this flesh is life-giving. 
This flesh communicates the spirit. Okay, so this is where I remember reading this in terms of Cyril's commentary on John chapter 6, and that, that was just so helpful because sometimes, sometimes you have the objection, uh, well, this, um, the flesh is of no avail. The spirit gives life. Well, the spirit gives life. Where are you going to find the spirit? The spirit is in Christ's own flesh. Okay. Thanks. Yes? Um, great lecture, by the way. It was very insightful. Um, my, my question is, is there a temptation in Catholicism, uh, especially in like certain Latin American countries, um, to deify Mary? And for, for, for instance, I heard this the other day uh, from a professor of mine where she said 90% of Mexicans are Catholic, but 100% of them are Guadalupeanos. Um, so uh, could you say that, um, that there, there is this like lack of education possibly in these countries in regards to the saints? Okay, the question is precisely in terms of Latin America, but I'd like to abstract that in terms of just talking about any particular culture or, or people. And, uh, and that deification of the saints with the example of Our Lady, particularly as Our Lady Guadalupe. Okay, so, uh, so just in terms of thinking about what is God's intention? God's intention is to deify us. I, uh, uh, it, by the way, if somebody is, um, is into self-deification, that's certainly not Christian. If um, someone is ministering, okay, in some fashion, then God is taking that person up in terms of the, the ministry, okay, for God working through ministry for deification. Um, the flip side of a deification is a veneration or um, a general word of worship, but today many people think of worship as adoration, strictly speaking, in Greek latria. Okay, what do I mean? St. Thomas Aquinas, when he treats the virtue of religion uh, in the Secunda Secunda of the Summa, the last article asks, is religion the same as sanctity? And he says, yes. All right, so what does this mean? That the one who most worships God is most holy. And that which is holy deserves some sort of veneration. All right, so this is where in terms of just thinking about how... Um, when God calls us to reign with him, and so this is where, in terms of considering uh, salvation history, God wants us to know that there are saints who have made it by the blood of Jesus, so that we have a vision already of heaven, say, in terms of the book of Revelation, that, that there, there's a multitude of saints. And the Catholic Church's magisterium uh, and then uh, popular piety can, in different ways, affirm about how there are saints in heaven who are powerful intercessors and models who have been deified, and they, in a sense, deserve in God our veneration. Of all the saints, whose tops? The Blessed Virgin Mary. All right, so this is where, in terms of, of uh, there's this phrase, uh, never enough, in terms of, of the veneration of Our Lady. Now, the thing about it is, why? Because she worships God. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She said, all generations will call me blessed. All generations will call me blessed. And so this is where, in terms of thinking about how uh, that is true, uh, she, she's the most deified one. Now, can you get this wrong? Yes, every truth can be misunderstood, uh, uh, altered, abused. Okay. Um, so this is where, in terms of Our Lady is most deified because she most perfectly worships God. And she wants us to join in humility her worship of God. If she in some way is substituted for God, well, that's not Christian. All right, so occasionally, you, um, you, because she says, do whatever he tells you. Her last words in the Bible, the, book of, uh, the Gospel of John, do whatever he tells you at the wedding feast of Cana. And so, uh, so that's where, in terms of how every truth could be misused or, or misunderstood or mispracticed, um, and then also to be able to see she is special. And, and you need to, to say both of those things. Yeah. So if, if someone is uh, more in favor of Our Lady than her son, she would be the first to say, that's ludicrous. Okay?
okay? And, and to be able just to, to, to help people, because sometimes people need a little extra help. And, and that's where, in terms of also matters of heresy, there are all sorts of things that are material heresy, meaning they're just wrong, but formal heresy, meaning that someone is invested in it and is obstinate in this uh, willful choice against what the church teaches, that's a different matter. But there are, you know, maybe I already committed three material heresies in this talk, you know, because, uh, but I don't mean to, okay? So Father Jonah can correct me or, uh, so, yes? Um, St. Ignatius is called God became man so that man could become God. Would it be better uh, to avoid confusion to say God became man so that man could become like God? Okay, so the question is, uh, the Athanasian formula that's taken up in different ways, uh, uh, would it be better to say, rather than God became man, so that man become God, that man could become like God? Okay, so in terms of, could, wouldn't that just be easier? Well, um, to become like God, that would be fine. The thing about it is that John chapter 10 quotes the psalm, on our Lord's lips, I say you are gods. And scripture itself cannot be set aside. So this is where, in terms of, sometimes people want to improve upon what our Lord says. Um, seriously, uh, but, uh, uh, but I, I like what our Lord says. And in John chapter 10, <laughs> in John chapter 10, beginning verse 31, the Jews again picked up rocks to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my father. For which of these are you trying to stone me? The Jews answered him, we are not stoning you, stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. You, a man, are making yourself God. You, a man, are making yourself God. That's the accusation against our Lord. Jesus answered them, Is it written in your law, I said, you are gods? If it calls them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, can you say that the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent to the world blasphemes because I said, I am the Son of God? All right, so this is an a fortiori argument where Jesus says, okay, in your own scripture it says you are gods, and scripture cannot be set aside. Well, uh, how much more true is it for me, Jesus, to say, I am the Son of God? All right, so uh, can you say that God became man so that man can become like God? That's fine. But also know that there are other variations. And then, by the way, in terms of Athanasius' Greek, sometimes, uh, there are particular verbal forms that you can't quite do in English well. Uh, but then you can also have, frankly, both in Greek and Latin, uh, uh, simply gods. Yes. Okay, do we have time for one more question? Okay, so. Um, I'm just curious, in your uh, part about Mormonism, um, I've heard from my Mormon friend that they believe that they will inhabit their own planet um, after death. And so I'm curious, in terms of deification, if they are deifying themselves towards a god who uh, created that they become gods who also create, basically like what the relation is um, between that teaching. Okay, so the question is about specifically a Mormon teaching uh, uh, that uh, in terms of becoming gods, that then they could become a god of their own world and then could create within that world. Uh, I'm not a Mormon and I'm not a Mormon uh, expert, so I would defer to them about what they teach and to ask them, uh, to ask them. So again, when Rome in 2001 declared that their baptism was not a Christian baptism, was not a valid baptism, and they're not Christian, um, they're just they're quoting their own texts, and so that's where uh, you, um, you should we, we should you know yeah, it's good to have Mormon friends and to talk to them about what they believe, all right? But uh, uh, so I'd rather I I'm not in a position to answer for them what they say. I'm in a position as uh, a Catholic to be able to say, this is what the Catholic Church teaches, and that's the ramification when we have discussions about deification. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.tomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.